Hello to everyone. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, to the Myeloma Patients Europe Organization for inviting me to this uh, meeting with the patients. And uh, my name is Maria Victoria Mateos. I work as hematologist at the University Hospital of Salamanca in Spain. And uh, I will address uh, the topic of uh, monoclonal gammopathy as well as uh, smoldering myeloma. In the next slide, you can see my conflict of interest. And uh, here you can see a clinical case, the most common way in which we do the diagnosis of either monoclonal gammopathy or smoldering myeloma. Asymptomatic patients that in a routine analysis, the total serum proteins are elevated with a normal albumin, the hemogram and the biochemistry are usually normal. And the general practitioners usually performs serum protein electrophoresis in order to identify what you see here in the slide, AM component. The next step is to go to the bone marrow because you know is in the bone marrow when the plasma cells are produced. And these plasma cells are responsible of the production of this monoclonal component. And if we consider these two features, plasma cell proliferating into the bone marrow together with the M component, we are going to be able to do the diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy or smoldering myeloma or multiple myeloma. Monoclonal gammopathy is defined by the presence of a monoclonal component inferior to three grams per deciliter, and the plasma cell bone marrow infiltration is quite low, less than 10%. But important comment is that there is not any myeloma defining event. Patients are completely asymptomatic. Smoldering myeloma is defined by the presence of a monoclonal component higher than three grams per deciliter in serum, and the plasma cell bone marrow infiltration is between 10 and 60%. But again, there is not any myeloma defining event. And this is the main difference between MGAS smoldering and myeloma, because multiple myeloma is basically characterized by the presence of myeloma defining events clinical symptomatology. One important comment, when we have in front of us patients in which we suspect the monoclonal gammopathy, smoldering or multiple myeloma, you have to know that there are some other concomitant diseases that sometimes can mimic the myeloma-related symptomatology. Smoldering and monoclonal gammopathy and even myeloma usually affected to the, to the elderly population and it's quite common to have in front of us patients with some degree of anemia or some degree of renal impairment because of hypertension or diabetes. We have to be very sure that this symptomatology is or not related with the plasma cell bone marrow infiltration because the management of a monoclonal gammopathy, smoldering, and multiple myeloma is completely different. And a second important consideration before doing the diagnosis of a monoclonal gammopathy or smothering is the confirmation of the results. And we have to repeat the hemogram, the biochemistry, the serum protein uh, electrophoresis, the urine protein electrophoresis in approximately two or three months' times in order to confirm that everything remains stable. And if this is the case, we do the diagnosis of MGAS smothering. And the next step is to inform to the patients about the diagnosis. Monoclonal gammopathy is uh, basically divided in three different subtypes, non-IgM MGAS, IgM light chain MGAS. But maybe this is not important for you. What is important to see is that the MGAS is a very frequent disease and over 5% of the population older than 70 years can present a monoclonal gammopathy. And this is the work cap recommended when we have in front of us a patient with monoclonal gammopathy. And together with the medical history, hemogram, biochemistry, what is very relevant because we have to be sure that you don't present any anemia, renal impairment, hypercalcemia. We have to do the protein studies in order to very well characterize 
the type and the size of the monoclonal component. It is also possible to do the serum free light chain and the serum free light chain ratio because they are going to help us to evaluate the prognosis and the potential risk of progression to multiple myeloma. It is recommended to do bone marrow aspirate plus minus biopsy in order to evaluate how many plasma cells are infiltrating the bone marrow. And definitely we need to evaluate the bone disease. And for doing this, the optimal assessment is to do low dose CT or PET CT or MRI and only to reserve X-ray if there is not any other possibility. Important consideration, when we do the diagnosis of a monoclonal gammopathy, and the M protein is lower than 1.5 grams per deciliter, so very low M component. And the type of monoclonal component is IgG. In principle, the risk of progression to multiple myeloma for this patient is extremely low, and it would not be recommended to do bone marrow or bone disease evaluation. Of course, this is what the guidelines recommend us, but we have to consider another important information and is the discussion with the patient. And if the patient is young and the patient is anxious and nervous because of the diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy, maybe it is appropriate to do the bone marrow as well as the bone disease evaluation in order to be sure about the diagnosis. And when the MGAS decides the type of the monoclonal component is IgM, your physician will usually order a CT in order to evaluate if you have adenomegalis, adenopathies, because the probability of progression to another different type of disease, the Baldestron macroglobulinemia. Overall, and this message, I think that is very important for the patients. The risk of progression to multiple myeloma for patients with monoclonal gammopathy is very low, 1% per year. And this means that the risk of progression to myeloma is 10% at 10 years, 20% at 20 years, and most patients will never progress to multiple myeloma. Anyway, we can utilize, and I think that this is not important for you, some specific features like the size of the monoclonal component or the free light chain ratio or the bone marrow compartment to evaluate very well the plasma cells in order to establish different models and in order to accurate the risk of progression to multiple myeloma. But overall, you have to know that the risk of progression to myeloma is quite low. It is recommended to do a follow-up because if patients with MGAS are followed by the hematologist or even the general practitioner for patients with a very low risk of progression to multiple myeloma, they are going to be able to detect another potential concomitant disease in these follow-ups and definitely the benefit in overall survival is going to be greater. So low risk MGAS can be followed every two or every three years. If after the first year, the M component remains stable. If the risk of progression to multiple myeloma is a bit higher, it is recommended to follow patients with MGAS at least once per year in order to evaluate the M component, hemogram and biochemistry. And in principle, it is not necessary to do anything else. What happens with smoldering myeloma? Smoldering myeloma is between MGAS and multiple myeloma, and the disease is a bit different because the M component is higher than three grams, and the plasma cell bone marrow infiltration is also higher than 10%, but lower than 60%. But myeloma-defining events are not present. Patients are completely asymptomatic. The workup is a bit more complex and it requires the medical history, hemogram, biochemistry, protein studies, but I decided to remark here in blue some approaches, some uh, techniques that are mandatory in patients with MGAS. Serum free light chain measurement, bone marrow aspirate plus minus biopsy, as well as the MRI of the spine and pelvis or ideally whole body MRI together with low dose CT or PET CT in order to evaluate the possibility of bone disease.
why I decided to remark these three assessments, serum free light chain, plasma cell bone marrow infiltration, and MRI at least of the spine and pelvis. Because uh, the definition of multiple myeloma, those patients who require immediate active therapy, was updated at the end of 2014. Because uh, when a asymptomatic myeloma, a, a asymptomatic patient, so patient with smoldering myeloma, presenting with any one or more of the biomarkers that you can see here in a red square, the probability of progression to multiple myeloma is extremely higher. And we had the opportunity to see that a asymptomatic smoldering myeloma patient with more than 60% of plasma cell in the bone marrow, these patients were going to progress to myeloma within the next year. And the same is applicable for smoldering myeloma with a serum free light chain ratio higher than 100. And the same is applicable to smoldering myeloma and in MRI when more than two focal lesions were present. The International Myeloma Working Group considered these biomarkers and they decided to incorporate this to the definition of myeloma. And this means that the definition of myeloma was expanded and some patients considered as asymptomatic myeloma patients, smoldering myeloma patients in the past are now considered as multiple myeloma. These patients do not present any crab symptomatology, but we know that they were going to develop this crab symptomatology in the next year. And this is the reason why we decided to remove this smoldering myeloma into the definition of multiple myeloma. You have to know that this proportion of new patients with multiple myeloma is rather small, and we have to consider again what happens with the rest of patients with smoldering myeloma when they are not included within the definition of multiple myeloma. And here you can see a small monoclonal gammopathy, smoldering, and myeloma. And I think that this slide is very illustrative. Smoldering is a burning disease, and we can find here some patients in which it is going to be very difficult to move to the overt fire. These patients are comparable to the low risk smoldering myeloma. We are going to have patients that they are going to move rapidly to the over file, so to the multiple myeloma. And in the middle, we are going to have intermediate risk smoldering myeloma patients. You can understand that when we have in the clinic a patient with smoldering myeloma, the first thing the hematologist must do is to evaluate in which group you are in order to evaluate the risk of progression to multiple myeloma. And there are different models and different approaches in order to evaluate the risk of progression to multiple myeloma. But you have to know that the International Myeloma Working Group evaluated more than 1,000 patients with smoldering in order to establish this model. And it's very simple because this model includes the serum M spike, two grams, free light chain ratio, 20, plasma cell bone marrow infiltration, 20. When a patient with a smoldering myeloma presents known of these factors, the risk of progression to multiple myeloma is going to be very low, 5% at two years. When a smoldering myeloma presents just one of these three risk factors, the risk is intermediate, 17% at two years. And when the patient presents two or three of these risk factors, the probability of progression to multiple myeloma is higher, approximately 50% at two years. And this is the high risk group of patients with smoldering myeloma. And your physician can incorporate also the presence of cytogenetic abnormalities. It's true that there are other different models available to evaluate the risk of progression to multiple myeloma. And a practical approach is to follow how the M component evolves over time. And if your physician see that the M component is increasing over time, definitely the probability of progressing to multiple myeloma is going to be higher 
than in those patients in which the M component remains stable over time. But uh, how to manage this information? From my point of view, the most relevant information is that every physician with a smoldering myeloma patient in front of him or her, the first thing is to evaluate these biomarkers I previously showed you in order to see if the diagnosis is smoldering or myeloma. And the next step is to evaluate the risk of progression to multiple myeloma because the management is definitely going to be risk adapted and it is very appropriate to identify especially those patients in which we know that the risk of progression to multiple myeloma is going to be of approximately 50% at two years. The management, risk adapted, as I previously told you, and this is a example, 56-year-old man with M component 1.8, plasma cell bone marrow infiltration 12%, serum free light chain ratio 9, no myeloma defining event, risk of progression to multiple myeloma, 5% at two years. I would not treat this patient, and this patient should be followed once per year. A second patient, 68-year-old woman with M component 1.8, plasma cell bone marrow infiltration 22, serum free light chain ratio 10. According to this model, the risk of progression to multiple myeloma would be 17% at two years. I would not treat to this patient, and I would follow this patient every four, six months during the first two years in order to see how the M component evolves, and if everything is stable, I would follow this patient just once per year. Which evaluations your physician has to do every visit? At least hemogram and biochemistry protein studies. And the imaging techniques like PEC-CT or MRI can be done just once per year, especially during the first years. This is a third patient, 38-year-old woman, M protein 3.8, plasma cell bone marrow infiltration 39, cell free light chain ratio 79. This uh, patient has a, a higher risk of progression to multiple myeloma, 46% at two years. I would discuss with this lady and I would treat to this uh, young lady with a high risk of smoldering myeloma. And the same is applicable to this 50-year-old man with AM component 3.5, plasma cell bone marrow infiltration 25, serum free light chain ratio 46, everything is higher. And in addition, this patient presented a chromosomal abnormality plus 1Q. The progression risk at two years would be approximately 60%. And even you have to know that new molecular markers and new genetic analysis are being done in patients with smoldering myeloma in order to gain much more information about the biology of the disease. And it is possible to, to see in front of us this patient with a intermediate risk of progression to multiple myeloma, 17% progression risk at two years with an abnormality in the gene CEMIC. And if this is feasible, we know that the risk of progression to multiple myeloma in this case would be higher than expected, and maybe I would treat to this patient. This is just to inform you about the further investigations we are doing in the patients with a smoldering myeloma, and definitely is based on genomic studies in order to evaluate genomic abnormalities that we know that they are going to, to confer a higher risk of progression to patients with a smoldering myeloma. Anna, maybe you can ask me why did you plan early treatment to these patients with a high risk of smoldering myeloma? Because uh, point number one, if we go to the oncology perspective, maybe you know that in oncology, the early intervention is something very common to, to almost all malignancies in order to try to cure eradicate the disease or at least to delay the progression to active myeloma. And when a patient is diagnosed of a polypus and the diagnosis is colon cancer, oncologists don't wait to see metastasis in the liver in order to treat this patient. By contrast, this is what we do basically in patients with smoldering. 
But the second important comment and the second important consideration in order to plan an early treatment is that we are going to prevent myeloma-related symptomatology. And you know that the myeloma-related symptomatology is clearly impacting in the quality of life of the patients. But in addition, we are going to treat a disease less complex from the molecular point of view. And maybe the cure, or at least the control, is going to be easier to be achieved. And there are some evidence about the role of early treatment in high-risk smoldering myeloma patients. This is the first study conducted by the Spanish myeloma group more than 10 years ago. And when we treat high-risk smoldering myeloma patients with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, we observed a significant benefit in terms of time to progression to myeloma, two years versus nine years, with a benefit also in overall survival. And these data were confirmed later on by another study conducted in the US, in this case with lenalidomide versus observation, but the same magnitude of the benefit, especially in patients with high risk smoldering myeloma. And under the platform of lenalidomide and dexamethasone, you have to know that if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there are more than 50 clinical trials ongoing conducted in this specific population. Some of these trials are based on lenalidomide and dexamethasone plus a third drug like ilotuzumab, carfilzomib, ixazomib. There are some trials evaluating the role of the monoclonal antibodies anti-CD38 with very promising efficacy data, but also there are some curative approaches. And this is the curative approach planned by the Spanish myeloma group in 90 high-risk smoldering myeloma patients to which we have treated them with induction, transplant, consolidation, and maintenance. And the preliminary data are quite promising in terms of efficacy, in terms of safety, PFS, and overall survival, although it's true that we need more data in order to see how these patients evolve over time. And in summary, and this is the conclusion for smoldering myeloma, is a heterogeneous disease, is different to monoclonal gammopathy, and it is very important to identify the risk of progression to multiple myeloma. Personally, I consider that there are a couple of phase three clinical studies confirming the superiority of Lendex versus observation as early treatment in these patients, although I have to recognize, and this would be my first recommendation, if you are diagnosed of high risk smoldering and there is a clinical trial active, this is going definitely the best way in order to increase and in order to move forward with further investigations in these asymptomatic diseases. And I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.